morning and welcome to our Lighthouse Community Service. You're more than welcome uh, with us this morning and if you've been joining us over the past lot of months we're really glad to see you along again. But if this is your first uh, Sunday tuning in with us and first Sunday watching the church service then you're especially welcome and we're really glad that you could be with us this morning. In this morning's service John is coming to continue our series through the book of Acts. Over the past months we've been looking at the book of Acts and the Apostles and recently you've been looking at the life of Paul. Today John's coming to share from Acts 27 and tell us of how Paul was caught in a storm on the way to Rome. After that Matthew Lawrence is coming to share his testimony with us to tell us of what God has done in his life so we've got that to look forward to. But before we start let me just share a verse of scripture with you. It's just one verse from Psalm 27 and it says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And this morning as we think of Paul caught in this storm, it would be good for us to remember how the Lord is our stronghold just as he was Paul's. If at any point through this morning's service you would like to have prayer or you would like to have some questions under, answered or you just want to speak to someone, then please click the little live prayer button down at the bottom of your screen and one of our team will be more than happy to talk with you, chat things over, answer any questions that you may have. Just click that little live prayer button. On a slightly sadder note this morning, uh, we want to remember Reese and his family as they've just lost their mum. Uh, Reese and the whole family use our inner thoughts and our prayers um, at this difficult time. So be assured that we are thinking and praying for you. We're going to stand now and begin our service with the song Blessed Be Your Name. Um, so let's all stand together as we stand at our feet and worship uh, God and sing Blessed Be Your Name. Oh 
to stand and to praise God together even over a computer screen or over a phone screen or wherever you're watching this it's great to be able to praise God together up next we are going to open a prayer but before we do that Logan is going to come and he's going to do our prayer drill for us so over to you Logan take it away let's pray one two three Logan let's pray together Father God, we come before you and we just want to give you thanks and praise you, Lord, for your goodness to us, Lord. And Lord, thinking of that song, blessed be your name, Lord, when I'm found in the desert place, when I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Yes, Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, that even in the storms of life, even in the difficulties of life, Lord, we thank you that you are still with us. And Father, we just thank you that we can gather together this morning to praise you, to worship you and to hear your word preached, Lord. We just pray for John and for Matthew as they come and they share whatever you have laid on their hearts, Lord. And Father, we pray for Reese and the family at this difficult time. And Father, we can't begin to imagine what they're, they're going through, Lord. So we just ask that you would draw close to them, Lord, and that they would know your comfort and they would know your peace at this time. Father, we just um, thank you for your goodness, Lord, to us. We thank you for our salvation, Lord, and that we can turn to you and that you will save us, you will forgive us, and you will accept us as your children. And Father, as we go through the rest of this service this morning, we ask that we could worship you with joy in our hearts and with gladness. Lord, just be with us now as we continue on the rest of this service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So up next we have a real highlight for me, and I hope it's a highlight for you. We have our kids, our kids' songs. So kids, get on your feet as we sing Our Rescuer and My Lighthouse. We want to see actions. We want to hear people that have done the singing. We want, to, want you to do it all. Up actions and sing as loud as you can. So everybody, get on your feet. He's our rescuer, he's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh how sweet the sound, oh how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord our rescuer. There is good news for the captive, good news for the shame. There is good news for the world who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our rescuer.
Up next we have our memory verses. Uh, we have a lot of people have sent in clips from the memory verse from last week. So thank you for sending them in and we look forward to hearing those this morning. Over to you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2. When you pass through the water, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Isaiah 43 verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Isaiah 43 2. The waters, I will be with you, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not stream over you. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. Thank you. When you pass through the rivers, I will be with you. When you pass through the waters, they will not sweep over you. Isaiah 43, verse 2. Thank you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. But and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Isaiah thirty four verse two. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. But the weather changed abruptly and a wind of town strength, called a northeaster, burst across the island and blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let run before the gale. We sailed along the sheltered side of a small island named Cauda, where there was great difficulty we hoisted aboard the lifeboat being towed behind us. Then the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across the sandbars of Cyrus off the African coast, so they lowered the sea anchor to sow the ship and were driven before the wind. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began, began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, bolting out the sun and stars, <coughs> until at last all hope was gone. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place, and not left Kate. You would have avoided all this damage and loss, but you take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of... The God whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me, and he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You will surely stand trial bef before Caesar. What's more, God in his godness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It was just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. Thank you to everyone who sent in memory verses, and we look forward to seeing even more memory verses sent in next week. So write the memory verse down this week when, it, um, when it's said, and learn that and send in your clips next week so we can have even more people taking part in our memory verse slot. 
next week. Up next, uh, John is going to come and share from God's word with us. But before that happens, Samantha is going to read today's passage. So over to you, Samantha, and then straight over to you, John. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, today we're going to be looking at the subject of uh, trusting God in the storms of life. And um, we're going to draw our lessons from an actual sea storm in the Bible that uh, we started to look at last week. Now, why is this an important subject? Well, in life, storms are inevitable. If you've lived any length of years at all, you will know that storms are not just a theory, but uh, one of life's great realities. Now, last week, uh, Cliff was reminding us that Paul was on a ship from Caesarea to Rome because God had promised that he would stand trial uh, before Caesar. And at this point uh, in the voyage, the ship has arrived in Fairhaven on the Isle of Crete. And it's past mid-September and the ship owner did not consider the uh, Fairhaven a suitable place to winter the ship. So he made the decision to sail on to Phoenix um, some 40 miles further down the coast. Now, Paul counseled against this decision, suggesting strongly that uh, such a move would, res would, would result in the loss of uh, cargo and ship and lives. However, Paul's advice was overruled uh, by those responsible uh, for the voyage and they sailed on. Now, this is the kind of ship Paul would have been uh, sailing on. Now, the westerly gales that had dogged the first part of their voyage fared away. Instead, to their delight, um, there was a moderate southerly wind, ideal to uh, help them hug the coastline until they arrived at Phoenix. So the ship owner's decision seemed to be r the right one. All was well. However, they had no sooner weighed anchor when suddenly, out of nowhere, a wind of hurricane force called a northeaster swept down from the mountains of Crete. The crew tried to keep the bow of the ship in towards the shore to get some shelter from the island cliffs. But the hurricane got hold of the ship with such force they were mercilessly driven out to sea. And once they lost the coastline, they realised they had no chance of reaching Phoenix. And this kind of storm often mirrors life itself. I'm sure some of you can identify with uh, this scenario. Life is going along swimmingly well. You are enjoying, as it were, uh, the southerly breeze. Everything in life is on course. Then, bang! Just as you are beginning to put your feet up, you find yourself in the middle of a ferocious storm. And that pretty much uh, summed up Vanessa's story last week. Um, as you recall, Vanessa and her husband Steve were just enjoying life with their lovely little daughter Zoe. They go to hospital to get a bleeding checked and bang, they find themselves in the middle of a major cancer storm. A storm that would rage for months on end and turn their lives completely upside down. Now your storm may not be a cancer storm. Storms can come in, in many forms. It may be the sudden loss of a loved one or some chronic illness or deep depression or addiction, or job loss, or relationship breakdown, or a combination of two or three of these all at the same time. Whatever your situation, storms turn life on its head, comfortable living to survival mode. And this is what happens here. Uh, Luke records five things the crew were forced to do just to stay afloat. Firstly, 
um, when they passed the lee of this small idol island called Corda, they managed to get the small lifeboat on board the ship. Secondly, they set out to secure the ship uh, through what is called frapping the vessel. That is, they, they ran ropes under the hull to hold the timbers together so the ship would not break up um, through the constant pounding of the gigantic waves. And then thirdly, fearing the sandbars of Sirtis, uh, they, that was the dreaded uh, graveyard of ships uh, off the North African coast. They lowered the sea anchor to slow the boat down um, so it wouldn't drift so quickly. And fourthly, as the relentless storm continued, and with a lot of cargo now thoroughly soaked through and making the ship dangerously heavy, they started throwing the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. And then fifthly, on the third day of this hurricane, they were so desperate they threw the ship's tackle overboard. All equipment that could not be spared was thrown overboard. The storms in life are merciless and they force you to re-evaluate life. Things you once considered of high value and importance metaphorically are thrown overboard. The whole focus of life is just to stay afloat. How many times have you um, heard people say when they're in a crisis, I'm just keeping my head above the water? And maybe that's how you feel today. Just surviving, hoping that the nightmare storm that you're in will soon pass. But storms, you know, rarely end when we want them to. They have a habit of going on and on. Storms have a way of overwhelming you, breaking you and, and bringing you to the place of complete disorientation when you're no longer sure if you're coming or going. And that's what happens here. The, the terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. What a terrible place to be. All hope was gone. Without the sun or moon, the, the ship had no navigational aids. And this meant that all on board were completely disorientated. This loss of bearings meant they had given up all hope of being saved. Now maybe you feel a bit like that today. Overwhelmed, worn out, disorientated and without hope. Believe in everything that can be done, has been done, and there's nothing left now but a quiet resignation to succumb to these impersonal forces that are mercilessly storming your life. So is there any place left to turn? Well, today we are told there is no God and we live in a closed universe. That we humans are just chance beings at the mercy of blind and personal forces of nature. Moreover, we're told that the blind forces that created us will be the same blind forces that eventually destroy us. Life is all down to meaningless chance. There is no hand of providence watching over lives. So in a storm, it's pointless calling on some imaginary God to help. Now, this is a, a bleak theory at the best of times, but utterly despairing midst a real crisis. But the question has to be asked, is this world a closed system? Are the storms of life utterly meaningless? Are we really just at the mercy of blind and personal forces of nature? Well, Paul would answer all of these questions with an emphatic no. Men, he says, you 
she would have taken my advice not to sail from Crete, then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Really, Paul? Not one of us will be lost? How can you be so confident? There are 276 souls on board the ship who are all just hanging on by their fingernails. How can you say no one is going to be lost? Well, Paul goes on. Last night, an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said to me, Do not be afraid. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God. It will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Wow. So the first thing we learn from this is that the world is not a closed system after all. There is a God who undergirds all of reality. Secondly, this God is not removed and detached from us uh, in our storms. And this is a really important point. Paul said that the angel of God stood by him. God was with Paul in the storm. And this was Vanessa's testimony last week as well. God standing by the family in the cancer storm. And if you're in a storm right now, God knows where you are and what you're going through. He's not removed or detached from your circumstances. And God often gives his promises against incredibly bleak circumstances. Think of what Paul is saying here to these 275, including himself, 276 hopeless passengers in this half-sunk ship in a raging hurricane with no land in sight that they're all going to be saved. And Paul is convinced that the seemingly mindless forces of nature cannot frustrate the purposes of the Creator. Everyone on board is going to be saved. And Paul encourages the men to put their faith in God and to take courage. And that's what the Spirit would say to you today, in your storm, whatever your storm is, take courage and put your faith in God. You say to me, well, I, I've tried praying through my storm and, and things have just got worse and worse and worse. God just isn't hearing me. He's just not there for me. And that's a tough place to be, to feel that way. We can, we can feel overwhelmed and feel that, that God is just not there for us. But you know, God does not always intervene according to our timetable. And this is a hard thing for us to understand. Even Paul had to wait for an answer. I'm sure from the very first day, this massive storm hit the ship. Paul would have been earnestly uh, praying to God for help, but things got worse and worse and worse until the all-pervasive mood on the ship was one of complete hopelessness and despair. Encouragement and hope did not come from God until the crew and the passengers were all well past their limit of endurance. The truth is, God often meets us at the point of abandonment when we feel all hope is gone. Yet into the dark and the despairing moment, God speaks his words of comfort and promise and hope. Now that word of hope from God 
does not make the storm necessarily go away. In fact, here it continues to rage furiously. But the promise of God has been given. There was something now to hold on to. Someone to trust beyond themselves who promised he would save them. And I'm sure for most of these pagan voyagers, this would have been their first encounter with a, a promise of God. So what were they going to do with that promise? Well, Paul encouraged them to act on that promise and put their faith completely in God. But now, these men hadn't eaten for 14 days. They must have been terribly weak and short of energy. So Paul reminds them of God's promise that they would be saved, but they are going to have to do their part. There was going to be no supernatural airlift on angels' wings to the shore. Not at all. They were going to need every calorie of energy they could get inside them for that final stage of the journey through the breakers. Now, if they truly believed the promise of God, that God was going to save them, then that faith would express itself by eating the bread that Paul was encouraging them to eat. And true faith always requires action. True faith can stare the storm and darkness in the face and act believing God's promise of salvation. Now, while the crew were making up their mind about putting their faith in God's promise, the Lord was still marvelous, marvelously guiding the ship to the island of Malta. You know, I have a friend who made a career out of rig positioning in the North Sea. And he once said to me that if a ship was traveling from Crete to Malta and had altered its course by even as little as half a degree, it would land up missing the island completely. In short, to hit Malta in a storm would rec require precise navigation. But here we have a ship driven mercilessly by a hurricane, the crew unable to take any navigational readings for 14 days. But look what happens. The ship turns up bang on target. Well, praise be to the blind and poor and personal forces of chance and luck. Well, hardly do you not somehow get the feeling there's a higher hand of providence that is at work here. That God, rather than chance, is in control of this desperate voyage. Not even this crazy storm could wash away God's promise that Paul would stand trial in Rome. And this should be an encouragement to us. Yes, there are some tremendous storms. Yes, there are times when we are overwhelmed. And yes, there are times when we feel like giving up all hope. But mark well, even in the chaos of storm, the hand of providence is still guiding and no storm can thwart the purposes and promises of God. I'll say that again. No storm can thwart the purposes and promises of God. Now, I don't know where you are on your journey, but I do want to encourage you not to be duped into believing this is a one-dimensional universe. We are not at the mercy of blind chance. God is the author and sustainer of all things. He is the source of all meaning and all truth. And he has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ. And through his death and resurrection, he has conquered sin and death and hell and the grave. And in our storms, the Lord calls us to put our trust in his victory and in his promises, to act upon them by faith, 
that we may know his salvation in the time of storm. Jesus calls us to anchor our lives in him. Now, trusting Christ in God's promises does not mean a future in the glen of tranquility. Far from it. It may mean even greater storms and trials than before, as it did for Paul. But I tell you this, if you follow Christ and trust him, he will prove himself to be true to his word. He will remain faithful to you. He will stand by you in the storm. He will give you encouraging words when all seems lost. Even when you face the storm of all storms, death itself, if you have faith in Christ, he will hold you fast and take you safely through the valley of the shadow of death and bring you safely to your desired haven. To heaven itself. If you trust Christ, your soul will never be lost. You will pass safely through even in that final storm. So in your storm, do not resign your, your life to fate and despair. Right now, put your trust in the Lord. Put your trust in his promises that he will never leave you nor forsake you. In your storm, God calls you to faith. He calls you to purpose. He calls you to rescue and salvation. So put your trust in him today so that you can say confidently with the psalmist, and this is our memory verse today, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my saviour. My rock, in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. I'll say that again. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my saviour. My rock, in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. Psalm 18, verse 2. May this be your reality today. As you face your storms, may you put your trust in the Lord and in his promises. May the Lord bless you this day. Thank you, John, for your message with us today. Um, something we really have to think about, trusting God in the storms. Um, thank you for sharing that. It's very thought-provoking for us this morning. Up next, uh, Matthew Lawrenson. Our very own Matthew Lawrenson is coming to share his testimony with us. But before we do that, uh, we're going to stand and we're going to sing and we're going to worship together once again. And we're going to sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. This song is very quickly becoming a, a lighthouse favourite and it's great that even in the storms of life and even when things seem to be going around we can't trust going wrong we can trust that God will hold us fast so let's stand and sing together he will hold me fast
Just his hands been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight. When he comes at Well, hello, it's great to be able to just share a little bit of my story with you today. Um, my name's Matthew, as many of you know, and I am going to share a little bit in this service that is themed around storms. Um, and I've been thinking about my story and, and how I came to faith and, and what God's done in my life. And to fit in with the theme today, I'm, I'm going to try and share with you two or three um, storms that have gone through in my life um, but I'm also going to try and tell you a little bit just to give you um, background about where I come from and, and what the Lord has done in my life in some of the less stormy seasons as well. Um, as I start I want to mention a, a quote which I think is, is really true from a, a guy who was a journalist um, in the last century um, he wasn't a Christian, but he became a Christian um, in his life, in later life. A guy called Malcolm Muggeridge, and he said as he looked back on his life, it wasn't the things, the easy times, the successful times that he um, looked back on with, with real fondness. It was actually the difficult times, the storms, the, the hard times that he looked back on with most satisfaction because the Lord had helped him through those. And it brought to mind a, a phrase that many folk will know if they're from seafaring backgrounds or, or fishing backgrounds, which I am, that a calm sea never made 
a good sailor. And so from my perspective, I identify with that as well. As we look back at storms in our lives, even ones that at the time were just awful experiences, there is a sense of satisfaction when we can trace God's hand through it. I was born back in um, the late 80s um, up in Sh uh, to, to a family from Shetland. I was born in Aberdeen, uh, but they, they quickly took me back home to, to Shetland. And um, I was called Matthew, um, which means a gift from God, because for the years before I was born, uh, my parents had really had a, a real storm in, in their lives where um, the whole having children phase was, was not easy. Um, they lost um, two boys between me and my older brother um, and had other miscarriages as well. And, and that whole season for them was just a real storm. Um, but when I was born, um, it marked the end of that storm and, and they were so thankful um, that God had gifted them with another um, baby and, and they called me Matthew because they, they believed that was a real gift from God. Now whether I've, I've been that um, at all points is, is probably up for debate um, but that was the family I was born into. Um, Mum and dad, um, both Christians and uh, a strong wider family unit um, Granny and Da on my mum's side, who we we went to a lot and went and visited, stayed over, and um, our family was really characterised by um, fishing. So my dad was a fisherman, and fishing ran through both sides of my family. Um, it was characterised by a strong family unit, and and the third F is it was characterised by faith. We were brought up going to church, um, reading the Bible, praying, and all of those things which is part of daily life, um, fishing, family and faith. And, and that was a really good upbringing. I really enjoyed um, my childhood, had lots of freedom to roam and, and really, really loved um, growing up in, in Hamnevo in, in Shetland. And as I grew up, I, I got to know the Lord for myself. I, I, I went forward at a big evangelistic um, service when I was 12 and had committed my life to Christ and, and had a real sense of my sin and how I needed to be forgiven. And then as I went on into my teens, I started to face that, that kind of situation that lots of people, um, young Christians face, which was... What am I going to do with Jesus? Am I going to am I going to let him have my whole life, or am I just going to let him have a little bit? And that that was really um, coming to a head when I was about fifteen, and the whole kind of youth drinking culture um, was was coming into play. And I was starting to go out the weekends with my friends, and and I had this real tension of which way am I going to go? Am I going to go um, the way of my friends, or at least some of my friends, or am I going to commit my whole life to Jesus? And at that time, through various really helpful challenges, including from our pastor in our church at the time, I made the decision to get baptised and commit my, my life to Christ, to nail my colours to the mast, as it were. And that was, that was very public. And, and it was a decision I, I took, even though it involved some um, ridicule and, and, and some people in my friendship group questioning um, what I was doing. That was a decision I made then, and, and, and that was a really key point for me in my life, making that decision to get baptised. And not too long after that, I think the first storm that I'd really gone through hit, and, and this is the first storm I wanted to share with you, and that was when I was around 17. Um, my parents went on after me to have another um, child. They had Bethany, who was... Um, about about five years younger than me and when I was around 17 I was out fishing one night with friends we were out in the boat and as we were out in the boat we saw an ambulance and then another ambulance coming in to the village where we lived we could see it from the water and as we came in I remember coming into the pier and somebody saying oh Matthew um, Bethany's had an accident and um, 
so we didn't realise at the time how serious it was, but um, got a lift into the, the hospital and, and saw my mum and dad in, in the kind of waiting area. And I just knew the second I saw my mum's face that this was serious. And, and what had happened was Bethany had had a, an accident and um, she'd had a collision with a car and went on her bike. And Bethany um, quickly deteriorated. She was put on a life support machine. She was flown to Edinburgh and mum and dad went away with her and and, and I was um, went to, to stay with my grandparents and, and all of a sudden we were in the middle of this big storm just came out of nowhere and a bit like some of the storms you read of in the New Testament you know storms could just could just be around the corner and, and, and the least um, expected thing can, can happen and, and so there we were as a family um, with the real prospect that my sister um, could be either brain damaged or, or, or at worst be, be, um, could be the end of her life. And as we were going through that time, I remember several people um, coming alongside and, and really helping us um, practically, um, which meant a lot, but also showing um, real faith that God was in control. And during that storm, one of the things that had a huge impact on me was my parents' faith, how they trusted in God, how they handed the situation over to him. And that storm was eventually um, brought to an end with, with a wonderful conclusion, which was that my sister, even though she'd had a bleed on her brain and she'd had swelling in her brain, she was able to recover fully from that. And, and we, we got her back. In some ways, it felt like we got her back from the dead. And that was just a real reminder to me or, or an introduction to me to storms. I'd never really gone through one before, but my parents and how they showed faith. And, and, and um, I remember several times my dad telling me that God was in control and that we weren't to worry because he is good. And that, that hugely impacted me and still does as I, as I speak about it today. Um, but as part of that storm, I went down to Edinburgh to visit them and, and, and they were um, in the, the hospital, sick kids hospital there. And as we walked around and had a you know, walk around the meadows, which was just across from the hospital, I started to think about, well, you know, it's come in time to, to think about going to university. And as part of that trip, I um, realised that, you know, Edinburgh was quite a nice place. And as that storm came to a close, I, I then actually moved on to university at 17. And that was a big move for me into the into the city and ended up um, making some great friends and um, found a great church in Edinburgh. And as part of my time there, I was asked um, to be the president of the Christian Union at the university I went to, which sounds like quite a grand title, but it really wasn't. Um, we were just a, a couple of dozen um, students who gathered um, midweek to have a, a, a meeting and, and then also um, do some other things on the campus. Um, but while I was on my year as, as CU president, um, storm number two in, in my life came up. Um, again, completely unexpected. And um, it happened because we had um, other students who were um, involved in what's called the Students Association. So that's the kind of umbrella group for all all the kind of student groups on campus, and they were not um, pro-Christian at all. In fact, they, they didn't like the fact that the, that the Christian Union was on campus. And um, they decided that they, they didn't like us, and, and they decided without any basis and without any justification um, to try and have us um, stop meeting on campus. And before I knew it, the whole thing grew into... Um, a really big deal. It started to get um, press headlines. We were in the front page of the Times newspaper at one point because we as Christians were being told we weren't allowed to meet in, in a public place, which obviously um, is against the law and, it, and it's against equalities legislation. And, and we found ourselves in a position where we had to decide whether we were going to stand up against this opposition or whether we were just going to quietly give in. 
And at one time um, during this, I was called in by the university authorities, me and another um, Christian student, and we were asked by the um, secretary of the university if we would stop, um, if we would back down and we would just quietly um, let this whole thing slide um, under the surface because they were getting worried it was causing issues for their reputation. And at that moment, we had a decision to make. We had to decide whether we were going to um, honour God and, and stand up for what we knew to be right, the good news of Jesus, or whether we were just going to let it slide and, and just kind of quietly let it go away. And, and we decided that we weren't going to give in, not because we were awkward, but because when we read in our Bibles, we saw Paul, who were learning about in Acts, and, and others, accomplices of his, Silas and Barnabas, and, and, and the, the other apostles being pulled in before the authorities and told to stop speaking about Jesus. And we knew that we had to do what they did, which was to say, no, we can't stop speaking about Jesus and we're not going to go away. And so even though we were, we were effectively told we weren't allowed to, to put up posters on campus, we weren't allowed to use the rooms on campus, we decided, you know what, we're going to do it anyway. And we, in that next six months, put up more posters than we'd ever put up. And every day they would get ripped down and every day we would put more up. And we held events and we continued to speak about Jesus to our fellow students. And you know what happened in that storm? We went from a group of 20, 30, maybe 40 students to almost 100 students who were meeting together to praise God and to share our faith with other students. And we saw students come to faith that year and we saw God bless us in ways that we could never have imagined had we not been in the middle of that storm. And we believed at the time, and I certainly still believe, that that storm was a test for us. And we passed, not because of our own ability, not because we were anything special, but because we trusted God to keep his promises. Now, that was and is something I still find really encouraging to this day. And after that, um, I moved back um, into just being a normal student after coming off committee again. And at the time, I was involved in a relationship. I had a girlfriend. And um, little did I know I was about to roll into another storm. And this time, um, one of my own making. Um, so the the um, the the relationship um, carried on and, until the end of university, and, and we ended up getting up uh, getting engaged, and um, and then just a few months before the end of uni, um, she called off the engagement, and while looking back on it with hindsight, it, it it's not a huge surprise that that happened. The relationship hadn't been plain sailing. I realised at the time that I hadn't been listening to God. I'd, I'd made plans. I'd headed off into this relationship and found myself caught up in a storm of my own making. And, you know, that whole process, that whole breakup was a hugely humbling experience for me, especially seeing as in some ways I was kind of quite a well-known um, Christian in, in, in the, the university circles I was in and in my church, you know, I would have been somebody that people, um, they knew my name and they knew who I was. And maybe in some ways I'd, I'd got a bit proud in all of that. And, and that whole process was very humbling for me. And it was in many ways, as I said earlier about storms, one of the best things that ever happened to me. Because it forced me to put my trust in God. All these plans that I'd had for the future were all of a sudden taken off the table and I had to come back to God and say, God, my life is in your hands. And even though I'm hurting, even though I'm questioning you and I don't know what the future holds, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to place my life in your hands. And it was around that time that I moved up to Aberdeen and quickly found my spiritual home at Deeside. And through Deeside became great friends with the Mersons, with John and Anna and with their family. 
and for the next three years, I had the um, wonderful experience of, of um, being in their home a lot and, and being an extended part of their family, which I'll always be thankful for. And I was also introduced into areas of ministry I'd never had the opportunity to be involved in. I was involved in prison ministry. I was involved in serving God in, in Tilledrone. And alongside many of you watching today, I've, I've been involved in, in the Lighthouse um, over the past few years and, and the journey that we're on. What an exciting journey that is. And, and that journey is still continuing today. But storms aren't easy. In fact, they're by definition the worst of times for those who are out at sea. But one thing I've realised is that they're not just permitted by God. God doesn't just let storms happen. He's actually the master of storms. He uses storms to shape us and to refine us and ultimately to bring glory to himself. And, and I've found that in my own life. You know, without these storms, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. And, you know, as I've gone through this past few years in Aberdeen, as many of you will know, I've met and married Rebecca, who is a wonderful wife to me. And, and we have a family together now. We have Hannah and Bella and Caleb. We've had the privilege of being involved in the lighthouse, as I said. We've, we've also had the joy of, of moving into Tilledrone um, for the past five years. And that's just been a real, um, really good step for us as a family to, um, to just experience God at work in the community. And we have just so much um, joy in serving God here in this community. One of the things in the last storm I was going to share with you, which is quite recent, actually, just a few months ago, um, that I wanted to share is, is my granny um, passing. So I told you earlier that we used to spend a lot of time at granny and dad's. Well, my granny um, passed away earlier on this year and she was a, a wonderful, faith-filled woman. She was one of these people who I had turned to in all the storms I'd faced in life up to now. She was always there to support me. I, I remember she was the first person I told when my um, engagement at university broke up. I phoned her up and I told her. And her, her response was to laugh. And, and not laughing out of, of mockery or anything like that. She laughed and she said, Matthew... She says, these are the things in life that happen and God has got a purpose. God has got a plan for your life. You're not to worry too much about this because he knows the end from the beginning. And I remember finding that such an encouragement to know that what I thought was the end of my world was actually just another step in God's plan. And she had um, got to, to over 90 years old and, and earlier on this year she passed away in March and just before she passed away I, I went up to visit her and she was speaking to me about heaven and she was telling me that she was looking forward to going to heaven I think she knew that it wasn't far off for her because she was looking forward to having no more arthritis no more pain no more sadness, no more death to deal with, no more storms. And that really spoke to me. And, and when Granny died, when she, when she passed away, I was asked to speak at her funeral. And I had the privilege of standing up in that church and telling all the family and friends that Granny was now in heaven, the place where she longed to be. And I was able to share her hope of heaven. And it's my hope too. Yes, storms are real and a present reality in this world. But you know, one day, for those of us who trust in Christ, storms will be no more. And we will be able to look back together at God's faithfulness through the storms to see what God was doing in the middle of those storms, in us and in the world. And we'll be able to look at Jesus, who was our 
anchor, our sure and steady anchor all through the storms of life. So I don't know what it is for you. I don't know what storm you're potentially going to go through next week or maybe you're going through one just now. Whether it's a health storm or a persecution storm or a storm that's maybe even come up from your own making. I know I've created a few in my life. But what I would leave with you is that we need to trust God in our storms. Trust that he is faithful. And when we hand our lives over to him, we have in Jesus a sure and steady anchor that will never be removed. We can trust him with our storms and in the good times because he will never fail us. Thanks for listening and, and thank you for um, letting me take part and share my story today. Thank you Matthew for sharing your testimony with us, sharing what the Lord has done in your life. That's our service coming to a close now folks. Uh, we're really glad that you could join with us this morning and you're that you decided to tune in to our family service just a reminder of the the memory verse for next week which is the lord is my rock my fortress and my savior my rock in whom i find protection he is my shield the power that saves me and my place of safety psalm 18 verse 2 let me just repeat that once more the lord is my rock my fortress and my savior my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. Psalm 18 and verse 2. So please record yourselves saying that, send it in for next week so we can get them on the church service then. Also, uh, if you're finding yourself in need at any point over the next week, uh, the Campus Food Bank is open on a Monday and a Thursday from 1 to half past two and if you're needing food or any sort of assistance in that way then please the details are at the bottom of the screen take note of those and um, so you can get in touch with us that's Mondays and Thursdays from one to half past two thank you for joining us this morning and as usual if anything that has been said or anything that has been sung or you're thinking about anything then please do get in touch with us. Hit the little live prayer button at the bottom of the screen and ask us questions. Uh, get us to pray with you. We'd love to do that. Um, get in contact with us somehow. Um, if you have any sort of questions or anything going around in your head that you want to talk about and find out how the Lord Jesus can save you, can rescue um, and helps us during the storms of life. I'm just going to close in prayer. Uh, and then we're going to sing one final song. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we just thank you that we can come and we can praise you and we can read your word and we can listen to it being preached, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you have been speaking to us, Lord, and that you have been challenging us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us during the storms. And Father, I thank you for Matthew's testimony and what you've been doing in his life. Lord, just be with us as we part ways today, Lord, and help us remember what has been said in this service, Lord. And if any of us have any questions, Lord, help us to have the courage and the faith to get in touch with someone to ask those questions, Lord, and get answers for them. Father, we just want to praise you and thank you for all you've done for us and for saving, um, for sending your son, Lord Jesus, to save us from our sin. We just want to praise you for that, Lord, and thank you. Just be with us now, Lord, as we part ways and bring us back again to this online service safely next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Finally, we're going to close our service by saying Christ, the sure and steady anchor. So once again, get on your feet as we close and we praise God one last time this week. Thank you for joining us and we will see you again next week. God bless. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me and my sins have all been torn. In the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are through, I will hold. 
Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He Christ the show. 